Hi, I'm Samuel from Zoom. For our stream today, I am very excited to be talking to Tina Guo. Now, if you're not familiar with Tina, you may have heard her cello or her electric cello. Tina is an est has established an international career as a cellist, a multi-instrumentalist, composer, and entrepreneur. Her playing crosses many genres. In classical repertoire, she has played with the San Diego Symphony, She's played with the State of Mexico National Symphony. She's played at Carnegie Hall in New York City, as well as the Walt Disney Concert Hall in L.A. She's done film soundtrack work on films like Wonder Woman, Inception, and most recently, the upcoming Dune film, just to name a few. She's worked on video game soundtracks, including multiple Call of Duty titles, League of Legends, and most recently, Cyberpunk 2077. As a performer, she has played with Adele, Katy Perry, Stevie Wonder, Peter Gabriel, Josh Groban, and countless others. She has played at the Grammy Awards. She's played at the American Country Music Awards. She is Grammy nominated. She has been nominated for a Brit Female Artist of the Year Award. As a solo musician, she has released 10 albums on her own label, and she's currently signed to a uh, four-album contract with Sony Music. I could go on and on. We're very excited to have Tina on for this live stream. Please ask as many questions as you'd like in the comment box. We will do our best to answer as many as we can. Tina, thank you so very, very much for joining us. Thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> so let's jump right into it. Um, you know, I, I, looking at your credits, it is obvious you are constantly working. Um, I know you've got a lot going on right now. I believe you have a new album coming up. Can you tell us about it? Yes. Okay. So this new album has 13 tracks. It is my favorite number, 13. Um, it has been two and a half years in process and we actually finished the majority of it during um quarantine uh last year because we weren't you know obviously able to tour so it was the perfect opportunity to really buckle down and work on everything remotely um and um my uh, my very good friend, Steve Mazzaro, who works with Hans Zimmer as a composer at Re Remote Control, he is the co-producer on this album, which is called Dies Irae, The Day of Wrath in Latin. Uh, he also co-produced my uh, previous album, which was called Game On. It was an album of all video game music uh, on the mm -hmm. same label. So I'm super excited uh, for people to hear this new album. It's kind of all over the place stylistically, but I'm kind of all over the place uh, as a musician and as a person. So I think it's pretty reflective of my um, maybe varied taste in musical styles. Very, very cool. Are you doing any music videos to accompany the album? Uh, why, yes, sir, I am. Um, <laughs> I'm going to LA next week. We're doing pre-production right now. I'm very excited um, because we're using some technology that I've never uh, shot with before, uh, Unreal Engine and some other interesting experiments. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, we are shooting two music videos uh, next weekend. So super excited. Very, very cool. Do you have any plans to return to the stage? Um, <laughs> yes, I do. I actually have my first solo show with my band. So it's like a 90 minute uh, show at the Tulsa Performing Arts Center in Oklahoma on June 13th. And tonight, my band, so my bass player and my guitar player from LA and Tulsa, uh, they are flying in and we're going to rehearse all weekend, Saturday and Sunday in preparation because we haven't done a show together, um, you know, with my solo material for like three years. The last time was at the El Rey in LA. So wow. it's been a while. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what other projects are you working on right now? You have the album going on, you got music videos, live music coming back, anything else? Um, let's see. So I, um, I guess like my day job, which I also love, I'm very, very lucky to be able to say that is working on film and TV uh, and video game soundtracks as a session musician. Um, so we finished uh, recording for Dune, um, Top Gun, uh, Tomorrow War, which I think is coming out soon. I saw an ad for it yesterday, last night when I was watching TV. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then also I'm currently working on the Tomb Raider Reloaded soundtrack. So it'll be a mobile game. Um, uh, Cyberpunk already came out. I actually haven't played it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just a little, you know, not little, I mean, you know, projects here and there. Um, and then Hans Zimmer Live, uh, we were supposed to tour last year, but the new plan, we're creating a completely new show, all new material. Um, and I believe the plan is to start production rehearsals either this winter or early next spring. Um, and then we hit you know, uh, we, we have a bunch of arena dates booked in Europe, um, nothing in the U.S. quite yet, but in Europe for a good three months, uh, starting spring of next year. So I really feel like things are starting to 
you know, ramp up and, and develop into a new normal routine. Uh, so fingers crossed, it'll, it'll all go as planned. Absolutely. Uh, question coming in from the audience. What, um, you know, film scoring work, it's, it's not something that seems easy to get into. What was, what was your first uh, kind of film scoring gig and how did you get that? Um, okay, so I went to school at USC in Los Angeles as a classical cello major, and I feel like everybody in LA uh, is somehow roped into the uh, you know entertainment world, film and TV world somehow. Um, and so I actually started doing sessions when I was a student in college for like you know the other uh, students who were there's a great film scoring program. Um, so I learned kind of how to do that, but my very I'm trying to think my first like kind of professional um, session work was probably uh, working on Family Guy uh, and I was in the orchestra. So now I mostly do uh, or I only do kind of solo work. So I usually record uh, one on one with the client with the composer and I record from my home studio but back in the day that was like I'm 35 years old so um you know whatever 15, 17 oh my god 17 years ago 16 years ago um I I was doing a lot more recording in the film like orchestras uh and so that was my first gig but most of my work um has been generated through social media um and I'm really passionate about always like talking about that about the business side of music but really it's just been through YouTube um Facebook Instagram Instagram now and generating, I think, a lot of content and just sharing like my music and what I do. And then I've gotten contacted um, by, you know, great, great people uh, to work on their projects. So that's kind of I know it's not a very direct answer, but that's just kind of how it started. And I think once you get into that world and then people, you know, it, it's by word of mouth and it's a very small industry, you know. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned, um, you know, doing some client recording work at home. I actually read in an article that um, be even before the pandemic started, you were doing upwards of 95% of your client recording at your home studio. I have to imagine that's something that clients love about working with you. Is that pretty normal for a performing artist? Does that open up a lot of opportunities for you? Um, well, it certainly is now, I think, after after this last year. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think for me, the whole figuring out how to record myself and getting a recording uh, set up, it started because I was trying to figure out how to record my own music. I'm like, oh, how do I, you know, because I wasn't signed to a label. I'm like, how do I sell my music or how do I get stuff up on iTunes so I can look like a professional cello player? Um, and so I just started with like, uh, I, I bought this old laptop off of Craigslist that I, I didn't know what anything was. I didn't even have a microphone or interface. So I just used, I mean, it sounded terrible, my God, but um, I used the in computer microphone and like garage band, you know, and that's just kind of how I started. So after some years, I, I got a basic setup together. Um, and I, I realized you could really expand your client base if you are able to work with people, not just in person in LA, you know, where I was living for over a decade, um, but all over the world. Um, and it's also out of maybe laziness, or I should say time efficiency. So I'm like, even going from LA to LA, you know, it's like, it's still sometimes two hours in traffic, maybe three, if you're really unlucky. Um, so I would even for friends and clients in town, when I lived there, I just would record from home. Um, and it just, it's something I think that developed over time. There's certain projects where you do have to be, you know, in the room with, uh, with someone, but it's pretty amazing what you can get away with. Um, and I think especially after this last year, we've all realized what can be done remotely, which is basically everything, almost everything. Hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> um, now, a uh, question from the audience. What was your first experience playing with Hans Zimmer? Oh my gosh. Okay. So Hans, I met him, uh, I would say what, like 10, 11 years ago. Um, and I released this music video. It was my very first music video. And without going on to, into a crazy tangent, uh, cause I tend to do that a lot. So stop me if I'm talking too much. Um, uh, I kind of was at a place where my electric cello career attempt was not going very well. I've been out of school for a few years. I was, um, broke, uh, literally living in a garage, half of a garage with like the the landlord's car parked in the other half um and so it was not good um and i was having a come to jesus moment and, and i just thought you know what maybe i should stop with my crazy dreams i should just you know audition for a good you know classical orchestra uh that's what my parents wanted me to do because they're both classical musicians you know have um you know, have health insurance and a regular paycheck. But I thought, oh, I can't like, I don't, I feel like I can't give up quite yet. 
uh, until I have my last hurrah. So I thought, because I would tell people, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I play metal on the electric cello or industrial music. And you know, people kind of go, not literally, but like proverbially, you know, oh, that's cute. That's nice, Tina. Cause like, unless you show people, unless you give them the finished product, you can't even blame people because everybody talks. We all have every human being on earth has genius ideas, but um, the, the difficult part obviously is in the execution and actually doing it. That's the hard part. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to put every penny that I have, which was not very much at the time, a few, a few thousand that like of my life savings. And I'm going to put it all into this like metal music video, just because I have to, you know, and then after that, I'm just going to go be a realistic person and, you know, try to audition and get an orchestra job and teach and do all that stuff. Um, and in the back of my mind, I did think, oh my God, like what if like Rammstein or Metallica or like one of the, you know, the heavy bands that I'm into, maybe they'll see the video and then they'll whisk me away onto like a metal. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, you know, I was young and silly. So, um, but but that was like my thing. And then I thought in, in the worst case scenario, I'll show my grandchildren one day, hey, look at grandma when she was in her <laughs> early twenties in her experimental phase. Um, so we made this video with the help of uh, some amazing friends and and companies that I was working with um, to make it possible. Anyway, the video comes out and then two weeks later, Hans uh, calls me. And so my friend Anne-Marie, who was working with Hans at the time, she plays a violin uh, and she toured with us for the first couple of Hans Zimmer live tours. So I guess they were working on something, I'm Sherlock Holmes. And he said to her, oh, you know, I'm looking for a cello player, you know, some someone. And she's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, this girl that I just met, because I met her through a contest, a My Grammy Moment contest on YouTube. I mean, it's crazy random stuff um and she showed him the music video um and that's that's why he contacted me so i guess my first experience working with hans i i walked into you know remote control he was having lunch with guy Ritchie and some other people upstairs in the back building uh in the kitchen and they were working on sherlock holmes and so you know, we talked, we had lunch at the time, Hans and I both still smoke cigarettes. So we went up onto uh, the back balcony, we were smoking, we negotiated my rate <laughs> directly. I mean, it was like, so weird. We're like, Oh, yeah, how much are you gonna charge me? And then, you know, we're talking. And then and then I watched the entire movie. And then we started working together. So that was that was how it started. <laughs> that is an incredible story. You know, you talk a lot about luck. But at the same time, you know, what I took out of that story is the number of times you put yourself out there on the line. Um, and, you know, you're never going to get it unless unless you put yourself out there. Um, yeah. So with that, you know, what is your top tip for somebody who wants to get into film um, or, uh, you know, trailer composing? Uh, obsession. And I think that applies to anything. Uh, I, I, I know it's a very, like, competitive maybe way of thinking of things. But I would tell myself when I started feeling lazy or, or and again it's very extreme I, i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna say oh you're gonna have great work-life balance because it's something i'm still struggling to figure out um but i would always remind myself tina for every moment you're not practicing or working or whatever there's somebody else younger better hungrier whatever you know who wants it just as badly if not more um and so that would just drive me to just continue to try to be uh productive um and so i think having and obviously if you choose to be a musician i think you already have a deep passion and desire to um to pursue it but you just have to really um yeah you have to just like compare yourself like when, when i was starting on the cello again it's like sometimes i feel like people will compare each other we'll compare ourselves to our peers but our very small small micro uh, uh circle of peers you know the people that we work with the people in our school and you think that's it so you get this mentality where you're like a big you know big fish in a little pond and for me to to keep myself I think grounded, I would always remind myself and people would say, Oh, Tina, you're like, you know, you're killing yourself. You're like, you know, I'm like, no, but you have to think bigger, you know, because if we're thinking in a global perspective, when I was starting out, you know, with nothing, I'm like, how, how do I sound playing this concerto compared to Yo-Yo Ma? Obviously, Yo-Yo Ma is a far better cellist than I am, but it's like having that type of comparing yourself to people who are at the very top. So you never set your bar too low. You know, I think it's really dangerous when we just to make ourselves feel better, we set our bars very low. Um, and then we might surround ourselves with friends and family who out of love want to be nice to us and tell us things that we want to hear. Um, so that's my I think that's my very honest uh, piece of advice. I think uh, that is uh, fantastic, fantastic advice. Um, what is your practice schedule like? 
Um, so I used to, when I was a kid, and it was actually forced upon me by my Chinese, uh, not even tiger parents, I would call them dragon parents. And they're also music teachers. So I had forced music lessons every day, which was, you know, um, really great looking back upon it. I have to say as a child growing up, I was pretty miserable. Um, but you know, the end result, it worked, you know, I got my 10,000 hours in or whatever. So I, I did about eight to nine hours a day of practice every day, since I started on cello at age seven, on top of going to school. Um, and then when I was in college, I did about the same eight hours a day. Um, when I was that era, when I was living in the garage, same thing, because I had no work. So I all I just woke up, I drink coffee, smoke cigarettes and practice. That's all I did. Um, now it's a little bit more difficult. Um, because, you know, I, you know, as, as things have progressed some days, I'm like, wow, I'm just like doing logistical, you know, office work and bookkeeping and making calls and doing contracts, which I actually love. So I'm not complaining about it, but now it really is a challenge to try to balance practice. So I would say maybe a few hours a day now. Um, but I think if you get that good chunk of practice established when you're younger, um, you know, you build a muscle memory and stuff. So it's easier uh, when you're older, older. <laughs> Very interesting. Do um do you record yourself practicing? Does recording play any role in your practicing? Yeah, definitely. Um, I th I think it's imp. Oh, not I think I know that it is impossible to fully see yourself. I mean, in a lot of ways, in our behavior as humans, psychologically, in the way that we're playing. And I started out where I would like look at myself in the mirror. But even then, like you're, because there's just too many things going on. You're trying to remember the fingerings, the bowings, you know, all, all of like the physical uh, elements. So I started videotaping myself. Like I, I remember I had this like old digital camera before cell phone cameras from Costco, and I would just like set it on a table and I push record. And like in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, like it's going really well I'm playing this piece really well and you listen back and you're like what the <laughs> what planet am I living on and I used to have this thing where I make I mean I still make a lot of like facial movements and I can't control it but I used to do this thing where only with classical cello I would grind my jaw like it would move like back and forth left to right for whatever reason when I played really fast and I did not realize this until I was you know videotaping myself so I really recommend like to my I, I do teach some students as well um and I, I tell them hey you have to video yourself it's not about you know ego or whatever it's it's the opposite of that it's so you can truly see what you sound like and look like because that's a part of the uh, performance presentation Fantastic. Um, question from the audience. Um, any tips for aspiring new cellists looking to do what you do? Um, okay, so aside from, you know, be obsessive and practice a lot and realize that you have to sacrifice having a life, you know, for a certain period of time in order to get that. Um, as far as cello. Okay, so I, you know, I'm I really love um, and I'm passionate about the presentation part of everything, you know, the performance part. So not just sonically, but visual and all of that. Um, and it's great, especially nowadays, you know, with social media, like every, not everybody, but like a lot more people have really, you know, cool photos, sexy photos and videos. But I have to tell you at the end of the day, you know, if you say you get a recording gig or whatnot and you go into a studio, nobody cares what you look like. It's what it sounds like. So I think the most important thing is that, uh, B beneath all the beautiful wrapping and all of that stuff and filters, which I'm very guilty of using you guys filters on everything, including this video right now, there's a slight, there's a slight uh, zoom filter. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, you have to make sure that you practice and that you play in tune and that you can sight read and that you sound better than the other people who do what you do. Because I mean, that that's, if you're, if we're talking about session musicians, you know, they're paying you by the hour and that's money. So you have to make sure you can sight read and play things perfectly or near perfect um, on the first take and that's and that's what um, leads to a long you know decades long relationships with clients and a career it's it's not the photos because one day we all get wrinkly and whatever but the playing ability stays there right you you know it's hard getting the first call getting the second call sometimes can be even harder exactly you just said much better succinctly what I was trying to say. <laughs> Too many uh, words. <laughs> excellent. So, so jumping to the whole, you know, performance aspect, you know, if, if you watch your music videos, your live videos, especially when you're playing the electric cello, you know, it's, it's the playing, it's the physical performance. It's, it's the whole act. Uh, is that something that comes naturally for you? Is that something you've developed on purpose over the years? Okay. So the, you know, I, what I love about 
music and different artists and especially listening for me to different artists performing the same piece of music or the same covers or whatnot is because it's so different. I mean, you could have one whatever cello player, for example, play a piece in another. And to me, what makes an artist interesting, and it's just my opinion, is when you can tell, when you close your eyes and you hear them play one note, you're like, oh shit, that's blah, blah, blah. You know, that's whoever. And you know, in other instruments, there's people who have a certain style or a certain tone, right? Or a guitar player, but there's a certain tone. It's unmistakable. The last thing you want is to be somebody where they're like, it's fine. It's okay. I have no clue who it is. It could be anybody. Um, and so uh, I think as far as like style, I'm, believe it or not, like naturally, I'm kind of more introverted and shy. Like for, for most of my childhood, I was super awkward. Um, I wore these huge glasses. I was actually legally blind before I got my LASIK surgery. So I had these really thick glasses and they kept sliding down my nose and I would have this giant cello on my back that I would walk to school every day. It was not pretty, you know? Um, and I think, but deep down inside, like the feeling that I, I'm able to, um, I think let out when I perform on stage or in videos, like that animal, like the demonic energy to be honest. It's like, it's like this very dark, um, like, I don't know what it is, like all the pent up rage and emotions and like everything else that it, it's always been inside. Um, but it took me a lot of years to finally allow myself and give myself the permission to just let it out. And I think instead of, um, you know, becoming a serial killer, which would have been another option with all of this like crazy emotions I have inside, I'm like, oh, if I like perform cello on stage, maybe not classical music, you know, but electric cello stuff, it's actually not only is it accepted, people are like, oh yeah, that's cool. You know, it's like, it's 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 in a safe environment where you can um, channel, you know, that emotion. And I think for a lot of, again, I'm not saying anything original, like a lot of artists and musicians feel that way, you know, about their art. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, question coming in from our audience. Um, how do you prioritize all of the things in your schedule as a working musician? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Okay. So um, most of the time this last week, I've been slacking a little bit, but I've shared before on my socials, uh, I'm a bit, bit of an OCD person. So I spreadsheet everything. I chart everything. I used to time block my days down to the half hour. Um, but I started kind of stressing myself out even during COVID, like the entire last year, every day is like time blocked, you know, color coded, highlighted. And then sometimes it's just too much, right? Um, so for the most part, like right now, in the last couple of weeks, I've just been, I still have a calendar and I write down the, the important tasks I need to do each day. Um, and now it's like, I have so many emails, like, you know, like 50, 60 emails that have to be replied to every day. Um, and so I'm just kind of like trying to manage everything. Uh, but when I'm, when I'm, back in my robot mode. Um, usually I do just block everything out, um, including times to eat and whatnot. So that's just, yeah, that's my time management. Um, and I do practice a lot more time to practice uh, like I have in the last week because I have a show coming up. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very fluid. You know, I just analyze, okay, what needs more attention? And then I focus on that. Excellent. So, you know, you're playing and you're composing across as many, many boundaries, you know, genre, um, you know, feel. I, switching between them, you know, I, I'm sure for you, you're practicing, you know, you might be practicing metal and classical on the same day. You know, is that, is that switching up easy to do? Do you have to kind of change your mindset when you're going back and forth? Um, no, no, it's actually, it's like, I don't know. I mean, maybe this isn't true for everybody, but it's for me, I can like eat like sushi, like on top of pizza at the same time and put it in my mouth and enjoy it. So I'm very, <laughs> I think it's, it's like a different part of, you know, maybe your musical expression, but I, I think, I feel like I'm pretty liquid when it comes to that. Very, very cool. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you get called um, to do a score for a movie or a video game. Mm -hmm. What's, what's the first step you take? Um, I think the most important thing, obviously, is having uh, a creative meeting um, and fully understanding what the client is envisioning. Um, and so, to, okay, so for me, I think of myself as, I mean, in, in, in the bubble of being a musician, right? I am an artist when it comes to my own music and my own stuff that I put out, that's Tina the artist. And then there's Tina the technician. Um, it doesn't mean that the artist isn't there too, but it's, I'm, I'm paid to serve a purpose, you know? So I take my ego, I take my own opinions out of it unless I'm asked for them. Um, and so what, like, I think when you're hired to score a project, whatever that project is, 
like the, the point is that you want to make your client happy. So for me, it's really important. Oh, do you have any references? You know, what, what, what is it that you, you can imagine? And sometimes people are very musically educated and sometimes they are not musically educated at all. The things they say, you're like, what, you know, but um, it's, it's important to understand and to make them happy. So I think that's the most important thing is to, for me is actually to take myself completely out of it and just understand what, what master am I serving and what do I need to do um, to make them happy, you know? Very, very cool. So the Harvard Online Business School recently published an article entitled The Business of Music, How Tina Guo Built Her Career with Negotiation. Uh, I think it's safe to say, and I think you'd agree, a successful music career today requires a little bit of business savvy. I think you even said earlier in the stream. Can you talk about that? You know, you were practicing obsessively as a kid. You know, you're going to college for cello. What is that transition into the business of music? What were the things that you didn't realize you weren't thinking about? Um, Everything. (laughs) And so, you know, in traditional uh, classical music, perhaps it's changed now, the the university courses. But I have to be honest with you. I mean, of course, I loved, um, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, I love my teacher, of course, in, in college in the classical cello music. There were some great um, chamber groups that I was in, but uh, Sam, I'm going to be honest with you. I did not learn a single thing that would actually apply to real life um, that would actually result in a um, career uh, as a working musician. And I think, again, kind of like the difference between an artist and a technician, there's also, you know, most people love music, you know, whether or not we were lucky enough to have music lessons as kids or be exposed to instruments. But the thing is, you could be a musician and you play music for the love of it, which is beautiful. And then you're a musician uh, trying to make money from it. And those are two completely different things. And I always tell people, like, it's the music business there's the word business and it's much longer than the word music. So you have to, that's just reality. You have to deal with it. You know, it's like when I tell people you're not going to have work-life balance, like, yeah, but I'm like, there's no, but like that's, and it's not just for musicians. It's for anybody in any field trying to excel and get ahead and like try to do something, you know, different. Um, so I, I mean, it's such, uh, it, it, there's like so many little steps and I, I, I feel like every single day I wake up and I ask myself, oh my God, Tina, what are you doing? You know, like, well, okay, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do? It's little, it's the little um, habits that we build and the things that we do over and over and over. And I know it's not glamorous. It's not exciting. It's not, you know, being on stage, throwing my hair around and what, like, that's great, but that's like, two percent of what I do you know it's really the majority of what I do is very analytical it's very focused it's very robotic you know and thank god I actually like that stuff you know so it gets a little overwhelming sometimes but um it's it's treating yourself like a business because that's what it is uh and I and thankfully now there's so much education available online for free a lot of it's free you know there's tutorials on YouTube um there's articles on finance and and I think it's it's good in general for people to educate themselves on these things because even if you're not a musician like in general we're not taught budgeting you know how to do your taxes like you know tax write-offs i mean for for anyone and i think these are all really important like basic basic life skills that for whatever reason the the general education system uh thinks is not important um for maybe for musicians and and certain other i don't know certain other people Mm. So Guo Industries, you know, when did you establish that? And, and you know, what, what was the catalyst for saying, OK, I need to actually create an entity for all this? Oh, my God. OK, so I watched, you know, Stark Industries, Iron Man. <laughs> Such a nerd. I was like, oh, my God, he's so cool. I want to be like that. So I started this idea of Guo Industries before I even made it like a real company. I didn't, you know, I didn't have like a license, a business license or anything, but I just put it out there. And that's, I guess you call that manifesting, right? Um, And so this was like, I think the, when did Iron Man come out? I mean, this was many, many years ago. Um, And, you know, I was probably living in that garage and then the, like the room that I was renting in the back of somebody's house. I'm like, Guo Industries. (laughs) <laughs> recording <laughs> recording on my uh, my old uh, Craigslist laptop um and yeah and then I mean now it's an actual corporation you know but but I th- I think when you have an idea in your head again and you obsessively work on it and you might not know exactly where it's going you know 10 years from down the line um but each day it's like the micro steps that you take um wait I, I don't even know if I answered your question was that was that uh, no, I think, yeah, kind of like what, what the catalyst was to, you know, starting Guo Industries. And, um, you know, obvi- obviously oh, now, you know, at the, at the level of, uh, you know, performing and composing, you know, it, 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 I would imagine it's a requirement for you to have, a, a, you know, an incorporation. 
Um, yeah, I think, and then also just being able to release my own music under like a certain, I wanted everything to be under the same umbrella, you know, and I had ideas of like, oh, I would have other products and other offshoots. Um, you know, I have like an instrument line called Tina Go Strings, you know, so I sell, we, we uh, myself and my business partners in New York, uh, we sell like cellos uh, and bows for all string instruments pickups, like all kinds of equipment. Um, and so all of these random like business offshoots, they're all, now they're all under, you know, my main, what do you call it? It's like a little Venn diagram thing, the, you know? And yeah, the, the kind of the umbrella over everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Uh, you know, just quickly before we move on, if somebody was interested in, in learning more about, you know, your strings and, and the other things you sell, where would they go for that? Um, so my main website is just my name is tinaguo.com and there's links to everything on top. Um, the, the, if you're interested in some Tina Guo cellos or bows, you go to tinaguostrings.com. Uh, and then all of my social media handles are just also my name. So pretty easy to remember. Very cool. All right. A few coming in from the audience here. First one, what was it like negotiating your own contract with Sony? Um, it took, I think we were going at it for almost, I would say at least half a year. Um, and I, I went back and forth. I remember I read through so many music law books online. I don't know what was wrong with me. I'm just like, you know what? I really want to understand um, what, what this situation is. I went back and forth um, directly with Mark Cavell, who now is the head of uh, all Sony Masterworks, but at the time he was the VP um, and is very, very kind person and friend. And so we just went back and forth and there was some, uh, I don't want to go too into detail, but there were some deal points that I was not okay with. Um, and so that's why it took a very, very long time. And I think eventually we reached a point where um, we were both comfortable and both both parties had to make some, you know, uh, we, we had to readjust a little bit, but the the bigger thing was, because at the time I also had some interest from another major label. Um, but the thing is, I already had, God, how many videos, probably over a hundred videos on YouTube. I already had not as many as now, but I already had a pretty significant um you know, online following, I had already released 10 albums. And I think especially nowadays, you know, the music industry and everybody, everyone knows this, it's not the same as it was even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, I, I feel like the people, again, I might be wrong, but I feel like the majority of the acts and the musicians that are being signed, you know, or given some certain opportunities, it's because they've already self grown, you know, um, their brand to a, to a level. Cause it's possible now, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it is over inundated because of how, how easy it is to release music and to make videos and uh, record yourself. But it's also beautiful because it kind of democratizes the entire situation. So you're not dependent on some, you know, huge label to be able to start making your music cause it's so expensive or whatnot. So it's, um, there's definitely, you know, positives and negatives to it but i always tell people nobody wants to jump on the bandwagon until it's already rolling down the hill and they just want to jump on and help you push it because it's already going down the hill um so i think i so i think the more that you work on yourself and your brand and put yourself in a position where other people suddenly are interested uh as opposed to like begging someone to help you because it is just it's you you put yourself in a weaker negotiating uh position so i think when when people know that you don't need them that's when you're in a slightly better a better position, you know, so you're on even, even, um, playing field. Very, very cool. Um, when were you introduced to the electric cello and how did that impact your playing and your career? Um, so I went to college for classical cello. I started experimenting with electric cello in, I think my first year. So I was 18, 19. Um, and I bought my first Yamaha electric cello at guitar center in Hollywood using multiple credit cards. Cause I, I, uh, you know, I had my student credit cards, I remember. Um, and I just started, it took me maybe two years, really a good solid two years to figure out cause I wanted to play standing also. And it was super awkward. And I, I thought for a while, I'm like, oh, it's impossible. I can't play standing, you know? So it, it really took two years of practice, daily analyzation, videotaping myself, figuring out how I could, you know, play and not sound terrible. Cause it was like totally out of tune. Um, and yeah, it was just experimentation and it came from a desire of wanting to sound like a guitar player. Um, cause I, you know, I watch these videos of these guitar heroes. I'm like, Oh my God, I want to do that. That's so cool. Like, I don't, I mean, classical cello is okay too, but I'm like, I want to do that. I want to play like, you know, rock and metal shows. Um, and how can I do that? 
maybe, you know, take the electric cello and experiment. And of course, when I was in, I think I was in middle school when I heard Apocalyptica for the first time, they're like the original cello metal uh, godfathers who are absolutely amazing. They play uh, acoustic instruments though. So they, they have a pickup. Um, and yeah, so I, I did see them, but for me, I started experimenting when I got to college. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, how do you figure out when to slow things down in terms of what you're doing? You know, how can you tell when you're taking on too much? I think this is a really good question, actually. I think, you know, and obviously this could apply to music, but, you know, really for everything. And, you know, somebody like you is always so busy. I'm, I'm definitely interested in hearing the answer to this one. Um, as a joke, I was say when you have a panic attack. Um, no, I mean, I, I pretty much used to operate like that. I think um, apparently I could even drive myself to madness in the amount of work, even during coronavirus, which I don't actually think is a good thing. You know, I mean, it's good to be self again, like, uh, to be self-disciplined. Um, but I, for me, I definitely have a problem with being too much in that way. So that's a good question. I think just being very, very conscious, um, of yourself, of myself. That's what I'm trying to do. I've started like meditating and doing yoga and taking time to work out every day. Cause I think it's, you know, I wasn't doing that for a long time. Um, it's just a choice. And, and sometimes, you know, I ask myself, I'm like, okay, is doing, you know, every single session that comes in, like if I don't, if I just randomly say, Hey, listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take any more work until whatever for two months, you know, cause I'm too backed up. I, that used to stress me out a lot because I was always afraid, you know, afraid of like losing. And I, I also don't want to be um, ungrateful, you know, to, to be in a position now, but um, it's, it's a challenge. Like I, that's something I'm, I'm working on and I feel like I'm a little bit better now at it. Um, but it's just a choice. That's it. I don't think there is like an answer to it. You just have to ask yourself, Hey, is it worth, you know, hanging out with whatever my partner um, or should I do this gig for this amount of money? Like what, and it could, it could differ day to day, you know? Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Tina, that about wraps it up for the questions we have here. Uh, this has been incredible. I think you've given some fantastic advice um, for musicians uh, of all sorts out there. Um, thank you. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. We are very, very excited to have you on. And um, and, and we wish you the best of luck with uh, with your upcoming shows um, and uh, and your album and everything else. Um, again, TinaGuo.com for everybody out there if you're ever wondering um, about where to find more information or what's going on with Tina. And, um, and there we have it. Thank you again, Tina. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and uh, this video will be available on YouTube if you ever want to come back and reference it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.